Yeah, so I'm also the founder of Earthscape VR, um, and we provide virtual reality and extended reality uh, programs based on the overview effect, um, which is uh, the experience that uh, the astronauts were talking about earlier on, uh, which uh, they have when they see planet Earth from space or orbit um, on moon landings. Um, and they many of them report back experiencing this sort of um, profound experience of um, intense or a deep connection with nature. Um, and they come back um, as you know, many of them reporting sort of becoming a bit more humanitarian, having strengthened their sort of affiliation with uh, natural and pro-environmental sort of causes. Um, so I was very interested in, in, in that, that experience because I was interested in altered states of consciousness. Um, and from there, I thought, wow, this experience actually taps into um, uh, sort of um, it's, it's quite similar, as someone said earlier, to psychedelic sort of assisted therapies where people, uh, you know, experience the strength and connection to nature and a decrease in um, self salience or ego. Um, and so I wanted to explore it more and find out more and see if there's any sort of therapeutic or psychological relevance to it. So, yeah, get in touch if, if you want to talk. Forgive me. So um, really, space travel is about the voyage and expedition into the unknown. It taps into our curiosity about what's out there, who we are. Um, and our origin story. It also captures the height of human ingenuity, courage, collaboration, uh, creativity and determination. Uh, there's, of course, two sides to, to space exploration and travel. Of course, there's, um, again, earlier on, people alluded to the sort of uh, double nature of, of it. Um, but my focus today is, is all on, on the positives. So international governments and commercial space industries have embarked on the next frontier of human space exploration. That's going to move us closer towards becoming a spacefaring and interplanetary species. We're taking those next steps right now with the commercial space movement and the Artemis program. Um, and uh, we're going to just explore so what some of the visionaries have looked at creating and how we're slowly moving towards um, those um, uh, creations. However, long duration human space exploration and off-world habitation programs present multiple psychosocial and health challenges. And they're going to need to be identified, which are already some of those issues have been identified through the ISS experiments and um, you know, the Apollo and Mercury programs and so on. Um, and they're, they're need, going to need to be addressed, particularly for um, missions longer than one year. Um, you know, we need to sort of strengthen some of those countermeasures that we have, the psychosocial countermeasures, as well as the physical health countermeasures. But, the, but it also these uh, programs and missions also present very exciting opportunities to consider and plan for the next frontier of human evolution, expansion and development. That's how I feel personally about it. So the success of this transition is going to be heavily dependent on how we come together to design synergetic off-world infrastructures and ecosystems that support human life on permanent space communities. Now, um, again, someone else earlier on in the astronaut panel alluded that we don't want um, uh, we don't want um, projects that are sort of isolated. What we want to do is try to really uh, bring things together so that we can um, think about urban design, we can think about eco well-being ecosystems, um, and we can think about um, longevity and the quality of life of people living, working um, off-world semi-permanently or permanently, as well as um, for, uh, you know, exploration, um, short duration exploration and um, science purposes. So uh, today we're going to go on a whistle -top stop tour uh, to explore the future of space exploration, the early extraterrestrial communities that might arise over the years. Of course, this is just a prediction um, of what could happen. Some of the psychosocial challenges and needs of dwellers at the early phase of exploration and the suitable applications that can help offset some of those um, challenges and meet the needs of the early communities. Um, again, we're focusing on the ecosystem approach as opposed to one application, uh, but we will look at some of um, Earthscape VR's um, ideas and how uh, we're trying to provide one solution amongst many um, in um, the, the well-being and uh, psychological uh, applications um, arena. 
So we have many visionaries that have looked to the sort of many years into the future to try to predict what will happen to humanity as we evolve, not just physically, but also uh, how our consciousness might evolve, how society might evolve. And some of them are, you'll recognize um, on the screen, um, but they've, for example, um, Barbara Marx, Hubbard, Frank White, um, Mikiao Kaku um, and others, um, Arthur C. Clarke have, have all talked about how um, humanity uh, will progress and evolve to become, um, to expand consciousness, but also to become, for example, Arthur C. Clarke talks about how uh, uh, technology, but also humans will become more godlike. Um, so we, we will imitate the gods that we worship um, you know, at some point, if our progression continues on um, and there's no big, huge catastrophic event. It's interesting because um, we are um, sort of looking ahead and trying to imagine what that future might look like. And these visionaries are giving us a glimpse into that. And of course, that frightens some people. It worries some people and they're right to question it and have um, to to try to have candid discussions about it. But evolution is something that is a given that it will happen as long as our civilization continues, we will evolve. Um, and it's interesting to look at the evolution of our species um, in order to think about what that future might look like. So um, in the summer of 1975 at NASA Ames Research Center in California, a team of NASA and Stanford University researchers led by physicist Dr. Gerard K. O'Neill from Princeton University came together for a summer program to theorize what future space habitats would look like with a focus on orbiting spaceships. And uh, the result was a document called Space Settlements, a design study. And um, I actually recently um, read through this document. I knew of um, Gerard K. O'Neill's work for some time and you know, knew of um, some of the things that he, he was do had done. Um, but I hadn't fully read uh, read that paper, and it's a very interesting paper for anyone that's interested in space exploration and space habitation. Um, so what will space colonies be like? O'Neill once asked the Space Science Institute that he founded. He said, first of all, there's no point in going out into space if the future that we see there is going to be a sterile future of living in tin cans, um, when we have to be able to recreate space habitats which are as beautiful, as Earth-like, as the loveliest part of planet Earth. Again, it sort of alludes to um, the vision of what with people are thinking, because this, in, this vision in, has, it has influenced heavily people um, now, um, pioneers now. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's shaping um, what we're trying to uh, develop off-world in over many years. All the constructs that um, in, in, in the, the sort of uh, proposal in the um, artist design, all the that they created for part of this, as part of this study were completely self-contained, rotated in order to stimulate Earth's gravity and would be built using ordinary materials such as steel and glass and would harvest the minerals of asteroids and they were lit by huge mirrors that reflected the sun's rays into the interior. They would provide protection from radiation and cosmic rays, use regenerative sources of power and provided pest-free farming. Sounds idyllic. Um, O'Neill believed that in these communities, there would be an abundance in food, climate and weather control and no need for vehicles that use combustion engines that would create smog and pollution. The inhabitants could comfortably live out their entire lives and have many of the comforts that we have here on Earth. For example, like exercise, um, they could participate in skiing, sailing, all these kinds of things. And perhaps they would um, create new kinds of sports um, because of the um, unique habitat that they were um, living in. So initially, the main goal was to design a permanent orbital community in space for up to 10,000 people that would sufficiently uh, 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 be able to maintain itself and exploit actively the environment of space to an extent that permitted growth, replication and eventual creation of much larger communities for up to one million, which came later on. So there were several goals that um, O'Neill came up with, and I think these goals are actually really important for anyone thinking about, um, you know, habitat design or um, uh, thinking about uh, ecosystems, well-being ecosystems. Uh, the, the, the four subsidiary goals were 
one of the, 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 the most common and basic one is you have to meet the survival and physiological needs of the uh, dwellers of the permanent population that's going to be living there. You need to foster a social community so that that community, that the, the people living there have uh, social activities to sort of participate in and that they can have leisurely activities and that they can connect with one another. Um, you need to have an adequate supply of raw materials and provide the capability to process them. Um, and, and it needs to be as sustainable as possible. You need to also have adequate transport systems and technologies. Um, and you need to have um, the commerce. So, you know, um, the import and export of goods and services. Um, so trade with Earth, basically. Um, interestingly, and you can see from the images in, in the slide, there were three main types of viable habitats that were conceived. And this is a little bit of architecture. And we're not going to stay here for long, but it's, it's interesting to know and it's important to know that these um, three main types of viable habitat designs are still being used today um, in, in uh, designs for other vessels. Um, but they, they included a torus uh, or donut shaped um, habitat, a cylindrical habitat, so having straight lines with a parallel um, sort of cross section at the top, um, and a Bernal sphere, a, a space habitat first presented by Dr. Bernal and later modified by O'Neill. Um, and basically this sphere would house people within the sphere. So we have um, three different, the parallel um, cylindrical habitat, the Bernal sphere and the torus donut shaped one. And again, these shapes are influencing um, designs today. Sometimes they're used together and sometimes um, individually and um, it's just interesting to explore. This pro project later led to the development of O'Neill cylinder communities at cis lunar and Lagrange points. Now these visions, as I said, of space habitats and human beings future in space ignited the imagination of many people for many years to come. Among them, Frank White, who was a student of O'Neill, Jeff Bezos, who was also a student of O'Neill and Elon Musk, who I don't think was a student of O'Neill but um, definitely was influenced by his work. Now, fans of science and science fiction are likely to recognize the description for a rotating station in space. That's because the concepts have been depicted in various books and theories for many years before even O'Neill. For example, the space, uh, space station idea um, uh, with uh, the torus and the spherical design was uh, popularized in the United States um, by um, uh, uh, by Werner von Braun, who was a German scientist who um, uh, actually came over to America um, after the, the, the Second World War. Um, and similar versions of the space station has also been conceptualized in movies like Interstellar and as well as um, 2001 Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, um, uh, which was also co-written by Arthur C. Clarke, um, which and based on his short story, The Sentinel. And if you don't know Arthur C. Clarke, he is a legendary um, British um, scientist, engineer, visionary um, author who, who um, made many um, uh, discoveries and proposals that have contributed to us, um, you know, for example, having geostationary satellites, um, communication systems, um, you know, television today, you know, having sort of these, these um, network televisions, as well as um, having... Um, uh, ISS, you know, his work contributed directly to having a, a, a space station. So although uh, we may be some time away from realizing these um, somewhat sort of um, science fiction um, images um, on, on the screen uh, that O'Neill uh, depicted and others like him, these ideas are still considered as viable options for larger scale long term space habitations in many years to come. So there are groups of people like the Human Space Program um, and others um, uh, that who are like a orbital assembly, for example, who are working on this um, long-term view and trying to think about what space communities might look like. Of course, we have different types of communities um, uh, as well. So that could be on moon, on the Mars, on, you know, we've got the moon village concept. We've got um, people talking about settling on Mars, um, space communities at Lagrange points, at cis lunar points. So um, yeah, so, and I'm gonna play this video. This is, um, um, this is a concept which is actually here on earth but it does capture a little bit, taps into the vision, O'Neill's vision, 
um, and this is something that is, um, you know, being worked on. Um, it's called The Line. Uh, it's a linear smart city under construction in Saudi Arabia, Neom. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a smart city that uses different types of electronic methods and sensors to collect specific data. And information from that data is used to manage assets, resources, services efficiently and to improve operations across the city. Um, the, the line is designed to have no cars, um, streets or carbon emissions. Um, it's 110 miles long um, and um, it's a vision that Saudi Arabia are coming up to build this by 2030. Um, and they're saying that this is going to create jobs. It's going to be much more sustainable and environmentally friendly. Um, and it's uh, going to it's going to cost around five billion pounds, which um, is a lot of money. But people are there's a lot of controversy also around this uh, project um, and criticism uh, because people are saying that this is going to have detrimental impact on the environment. Um, and um, what about the people, you know, that are going to sort of have to um, migrate out for, while the city is being built? What happens to them? Um, as well as how viable is it to build this type of a city and on this sort of large scale? But these types of projects um, here on Earth, the challenges that they, they give rise to will give us an idea, a glimpse into, um, you know, some of the challenges and even, you know, sort of some of the challenges that will come about later on when we try to build these types of cities off world. But also um, they will any any of the challenges we face here will be, um, you know, exaggerated um, at tenfold. So I hope you can see it. You might not be able to hear it because that often happens with my Zoom videos, but um, just seeing it will be enough, I think. For too long, humanity has existed within dysfunctional and polluted cities that ignore nature. Now, a revolution in civilization is taking place. Imagine a traditional city and consolidating its footprint designing to protect and enhance nature. The line will be home to 9 million residents and will be built with a footprint of just 34 square kilometers. And we are designing it to provide a healthier, more sustainable quality of life. The line's communities are organized in three dimensions. Residents have access to all their daily needs within five minute walk neighborhoods and the line's infrastructure makes it possible to travel end to end in 20 minutes with no need for cars, resulting in zero carbon emissions. By leveraging AI technology, services are autonomous, saving you time and effort. Designed by world leading architects, the line is 500 meters tall, 200 meters wide, 170 kilometers long, and housed within an elegant mirror glass facade. Intelligent solutions create efficiency and year round temperate microclimate with natural ventilation. Energy and water supplies are 100% renewable. The line is designed as a series of unique communities offering a wealth of amenities, providing equitable views and immediate access to the surrounding nature with 40% of the world accessible within six hours at the heart of the globe's so key trade The other trade thing routes. about this project is it's a, you know, um, an AI city, basically artificially led city, which gives rise to questions around um, surveillance, around uh, freedom, around um, uh, people's um, data um, and how that's going to be used. So the, the, as I said, it's a controversial project. Um, and also, we're not quite sure. They've started um, the first phase of construction. Uh, planning, I think, is finished and construction is beginning. They've already cleared out some of the city in order to build this. But um, the other issue is, is it viable? And it could just turn out to be another one of these types of pro projects that, you know, begins and is a sort of, it's a, it's a small version of the project. The full version is never materializes. Um, so I don't want to give you the long, wrong impression that, the, you know, this is... Um, Possible, fully possible, but it's certainly they're trying to do it. If you were going to set up a human habitation program off world in our solar system someplace, what would be your preferred destination and why? Um, I've got on the title destination unknown, but everyone has a different preference for those people who are interested in, in either permanently or semi-permanently migrating out. 
So uh, if, if you could put it in the chat, it would be interesting to see what, what everyone's thinking um, and we, maybe we can discuss it at the end. Um, but within the next five years, we will have the NASA Artemis mission well established, which is going to include the gateway outpost in cislunar space, as well as the lunar base for science and exploration. Um, and and the, the gateway is basically going to be this outpost, which is um, you know going to be orbiting the moon in cislunar um, point. And um, it's going to be a permanent base there. Um, it's an autonomous um, station um, and it will have crew um, uh, and scientists on there. And it's basically going to when uh, the, the first two units of the gateway are planned to be sent up in 2024. So this is all happening and underway. We've already got the Artemis um, two mission um, astronauts picked who are going to go sort of um, orbit the moon and come back. And then some point 2024 or 25, I think we're planning to send astronauts um, onto the surface of the moon for seven days. Now, the moon bases and the cislunar outposts will be our gateway to scientific discoveries about the cosmos and our origins and other extraterrestrial worlds. So in NASA's mind, it looks like they've planned this out to, to go to the moon first. And it's a sensible plan um, in terms of the next steps. You know, we, we can't jump to Mars or Venus um, or this sort of um, permanent um, uh, space um, habitats. Um, I think uh, I think the, the NASA plan seems to make sense to me. So over the next 10 years, we're going to witness the implementation of multiple commercial space enterprises. So alongside the Artemis um, program, which is actually an international program um, with many people uh, and uh, countries involved, there's going to be this sort of commercial push as well. For example, we already know that Axiom Space Commercial Space Station um, is going to um, replace the ISS and the ISS, which is the International Space Station, is going to be decomm decommissioned by uh, 2030 or 2031. So that's happening and that's going to be a, a base for scientific experiments. It's similar to what the International Space Station does for commercial astronauts, for, um, uh, for uh, uh, business um, of, of sorts as well, for people to, to rent out spaces. Orbital Assembly is another um, business that is a commercial company um, and they're looking to build some sort of a science st station in cislunar space. I think they might be having a name change or if not a name change, they're, they're, they're going to be um, having a different um, sort of division that looks at sort of um, um, other areas of um, off-world habitation. Um, we've got Orbital Reef, uh, Jeff Bezos's um, uh, baby or company, um, and they're looking at setting up stations in LEO, low Earth orbit. Um, we've, of course, got communication satellites that are going up um, all the time, and we're going to need them if we're going to have this sort of um, community off world. Um, we're going to need, um, you know, uh, Internet. We've got the deep um, space network, for example, already um, uh, sort of underway and uh, we've got other Nokia's trying to figure out how to put sort of internet on the moon of course the closer we are to earth the more likely is that we'll have good good communications and internet so um, we're going to need refueling stations of some kind um, you know depending on the um, fuel that we rely on um, and we're going to need ports um, we're going to need um, you know space vessels and ports for vertical and horizontal launches um, and these are all the, and more, um, you know, uh, people are talking about um, space elevators, for example, because, of course, the more people that are going to space or if we're going to have a viable space habitation program, we're going to need to have these launch um, posts and ports that um, don't rely on too much rocket fuel, aren't too expensive and are accessible. So we need to overcome that challenge as well. Um, we've got other missions to Venus as well that are planned, um, for example, the Havoc um, mission um, and uh, humans to Venus, who are looking at um, sending crewed uh, aerostat ships to the atmosphere of Venus, which is meant to um, have some similarities um, to Earth's um, uh, habitat. Of course, Venus, Venus itself on, on its surface is in, inhospitable, but in the atmosphere, there seems to be, um, you know, an atmosphere that can support some life. Um, and uh, so all of this alongside the other work that we've done is going to build the infrastructure and you can begin to paint the image of in the next 50 years what this uh, might look like, um, uh, the ecosystems, the infrastructure, the, the companies and 
and um, I think that's very interesting to do that. Of course, we can't forget the early work of the pioneers and all those wonderful scientists and the work, for example, the Gemini, Mercury and Apollo missions um, and the more recent International Space Station experiment, uh, the Skylab, the Challenger missions, alongside all the international missions, robotic missions, ESA's work. Uh, they've all paved the way for the next sort of frontier in human space exploration to the moon and human missions to Mars. And it's always good to give them a nod. In fact, we've been sending robots to Mars for many years um, from from the 70s. I'm not going to go through all of the um, robotic missions, but, you know, all the way going from Perseverance, Ingenuity, more recently, um, uh, there was a robotic mission uh, with ESSA called Beagle, which was a, a favourite of mine um, because it was a UK led mission. But, um, uh, you know, uh, but it didn't successfully. It landed very briefly in, in 2003. But, um, you know, all of this work has spearheaded what we're doing now. And we can't forget that. So take a moment to imagine in your mind, you've thought about the destination you'd like to go to. And now you've kind of looked at where we might actually be going initially at first. And now take a moment to imagine in your mind all of the viable plans for launch ports, transit, landing vehicles, outposts, early semi-permanent habitats and communities that will be formed in our solar system in one lifetime. So let's say if we're lucky, 80, 90, 100 years. Now span out another 100 years, add to that, what do you see now? So, you know, let's say 200 years, 190 years. It can really blow your mind to think about how quickly we can advance. And it's I think it's um, if, if we don't experience a big catastrophic um, event, I think it is viable because uh, we uh, exponentially have been advancing technology um, over the last 20 years. You know, uh, it's been so rapid, the de human development. Um, so this this might be very possible and even perhaps slightly sooner. So I believe what could emerge in our children or grandchildren's lifetime is an interplanetary superhighway through the solar system. Now, the superhighway concept was first envisaged by Calif Pasadena, who is an engineer at NASA and another um, uh, Martin Lowe, who's another um, engineer there. And they, they depicted a vast array of uh, virtual winding gravitational tunnels and conduits around the sun and uh, the planets. Um, and this is more to do with physics and, you know, um, sort of a pathway, gravitational pathway in space that sort of gives you a, a quick a quicker access to, to where you're going. But but the concept I'm, I'm using is it's an actual sort of super highway in space where you have infrastructures you have um, you, you, you're using um, infrastructures in a way which um, support one another and give us better access, uh, uh, further reach, better access for science, better, better access for travel um, uh, in space. And I think all of these companies, it would be amazing if they could actually work together to create these infrastructures um, in a way that are complementary to one another and support one another and perhaps um, that they are they are making a move towards doing that now once some of these essential infrastructures have been established more and more people will be venturing out to live and work in the solar system so we've got to get there first we've got to take those baby steps and we would then truly become an interplanetary species who tra travels on interplanetary highway to reach faraway lands for the pursuit of not only leisure, exploration, science and commerce, but perhaps to also find a permanent new home for some of us anyway. Um, so humankind's larger scale expansion migration into the solar system is not a matter of if anymore, but a matter of when. And so it is up to us as civilians, as scientists, as students to get involved, to have a say, to participate, to contribute, so that we can really shape that um, move out because it's happening. Um, so if we come together to implement comprehensive roadmap for this expansion and agree on what comes first and why, and design infrastructures and ecosystems that are sustainable, comprehensive, autonomous, synergetic, and supportive of life as we know it, each stage of development will need to address all of these different human needs that we're going to have when we're up in space as well, as well as the developmental needs. We're going to have different developmental needs at different sort of um, uh, points in our life. Um, so anyway, I've, I've sort of talked about um, that the first destination seems to be in cislunar, lo low Earth orbit and the moon, and that's where we're heading. Let's have a look at the future of um, well-being applications, the future of biotechnology to begin with. 
Now, Homo sapiens are remarkable species, I think so anyway. Uh, most of the time we're quite cooperative. I know sometimes we're not. Resilient, flexible <laughs> and adaptable. Our ingenuity and cooperation in larger groups has helped us create a re remarkable tools and survive wars, ice ages and global catastrophes here on Earth. We're quite young in, in, in terms of how long our species has survived. Um, so, you know, we can't talk too soon. Sharks have out, so been here for millions and millions of years. We've only sort of been, um, you know, the, the recent version of our species has only been here for 300,000 years or so. So we're quite sort of new on the block. But we're, we're doing reasonably well uh, in, ter in terms of survival. But the human psyche and body has evolved for millions of years with the primary purpose of adapting, surviving and thriving on Earth's terrestrial environment. So how are we going to survive permanently or semi-permanently off-world? So in relation to permanent or semi-permanent off-world habitation programs, the initial adaptation and adjustment period is going to be very challenging. Um, and in order to design effective and useful psychosocial and health countermeasures, careful consideration is going to be needed um, to think about this area of acclimatization adjustment, what happens to the human body when we're out of our natural environment and how can we prevent that, um, prevent um, escalations in, you know, um, uh, in degeneration of cells and um, genes and body muscles. Furthermore, it is likely that permanent migration to places like Mars will eventually lead to changes in the structure of human beings. So how are we going to evolve beyond our current state? Who will we become if we move to another place uh, in the solar system permanently? Will we even be human after a thousand years, 10,000 years? Of course, the process of evolution will take a long time, but it's worth considering. What are our evolutionary strengths and limitations and what environmental, biological and psychophysiological provisions and adaptations will be necessary in order to help ensure our survival? Successful adaptation is very important in terms of thinking of well-being um, solutions off-world. And this is not necessarily my specific area of um, expertise, but I just think if, even as a psychologist, this is something that we need to consider when we're creating our, our applications. Now, advances in biogenetics and genetic engineering will mean that we will be able to create synthetic organs or limbs with the ability to biologically, biologically integrate them into the organism. And in the not so distant future, we might be able to erase unwanted mutations encoded in genomes and even go as far as to create genetically modified humans. Again, this is a controversial area, but it is people are already working on this. Um, so, again, this has relevance for space, human space um, flight, but beyond human space flight, um, permanent human space habitation programs. For example, scientists like Michael Levine, a professor of biology and biomedical engineering at Tufts University, him and his team are exploring cellular communication engineering um, and uh, organisms from a cell and creating synthetic organisms. So his work has major implications for regenerative medicine as well as bio, biobot uh, technology. Um, biobot, so for example, regenerating artificial limbs, organs, cells, genes, you know, you can think of it and you can potentially regenerate it um, using um, the technologies that they've created. Biobot technology, you can use these sort of microscopic um, technologies um, that are silicon based potentially that, you know, can go and find um, mutations, gene mutations um, within, you know, within the uh, body issues with cellular issues. Um, and uh, try to um, uh, target that. So another recent study titled Mice, Mighty Mice, led by Professor Lee at Jackson Laboratory um, and his wife, Emily uh, Germaine Lee, sent mice to the International Space Station to learn about the effect of microgravity on muscle and bone degeneration. Now, these mighty mice are genetically engineered to lack myostatin and therefore display approximately twice the average muscle mass. Now, studies like these demonstrate how we can strengthen the human body genetically through enhancing muscle strength, which has wider implications for human space travel again, because, of course, one of the major issues um, that we're facing at the moment is um, muscle and bone degeneration. 
Um, and of course, we can tolerate that for up to a year. We know with the twin studies, for example, but what happens if we want to go out for three years for like missions to Mars, or we want to um, live permanently for 10 years or forever on, a, on another off-world habitat? So these researchers are looking to nature to provide fascinating examples of adaptation, resilience, longevity, and strength. And again, on the screen, you can see images of um, planar plan planarian worms who are remarkable and um, uh, Levine focused his work on planarian worms. Um, uh, they're remarkable because they re reproduce either sexually or both sexually and asexually. And these worms split themselves into half in uh, asexual reproduction. They can also regenerate parts of themselves, which make them appear as though they're immortal. You know, if we can understand these amazing organisms, um, perhaps uh, like the work Levine is doing, we can learn from them and try to um, uh, enhance uh, human capabilities um, or, or, or get rid of diseases that um, decrease longevity. Um, tardigrades, the vacuum of space and solar galactic cosmic radiation is uh, very difficult for us humans and complex man mammals and probably actually most, most um, species to, to live on. But these, these mighty, uh, uh, these mighty uh, tardigrades, they can survive and they've evolved to cope with the severest of conditions. They were here, you know, um, millions and millions of years ago um, from the very beginning of, of our planet. And they've somehow learned to survive any condition you can throw at them, any harsh condition. And again, they provide us sort of a glimpse into um, organisms that can do that here on Earth that have evolved to do that. And octopus is capable of high order cognitive behaviors. And again, they have um, specific um, types of or species of octopus have uh, regenerative capabilities as well. Um, and so we can learn from them. There are also certain human beings that, um, uh, you know, have uh, lived in certain conditions and have developed enhanced capabilities. So a group of people called Beiju uh, Sea Nomads can stay underwater for as long as 13 minutes uh, at depths of around 200 feet. These nomadic people live in waters winding through the Philippines, Malaysia and Indonesia, where they dive to hunt for fish or search for natural elements that can be used in crafts. Now, uh, a study um, that recently explored them uh, said that they basically have a, a larger oxygen reservoir for diving and therefore an, a, a, a um, genetic advance in cybernetics. AI and computing will support the work of bioengineers. So they work hand in hand in enhancing the human brain and body and will also help create exoskeletons that give us more resilience, strength and endurance to live off world. So. Living off world is not going to be easy. We have so many stresses to contend with. Uh, we have radiation, we have um, different atmospheres, we have a microgravity, um, we have, you know, being isolated, confined in a bar being in a barren environment. We, you know, all of these things, none of the luxuries here on earth, we might not have fresh air, we won't have fresh air, we won't have, um, you know, the cinema, we won't have any of these things. And so, um, uh, and, and we will also need to work and we will still need to go and roam and go out and do things. So exoskeletons are helpful um, on that side of things in terms of helping us just sort of do things outside of the environment that are um, intensive. But they also support people that have, have hurt, hurt themselves or have broken limbs and, um, and injuries. Um, so uh, we can also create wearable, wearable devices, um, predict disease using uh, biomarkers and um, uh, effective computer techniques. We can also um, create robots and androids as companions to help with complex tasks, uh, especially if they're um, tapped into artificial intelligence um, and to help with uh, heavy construction as well. So our dependence on technology is going to eat, grow even more as we move off world. We're already dependent on technology. We, you know, we have our phones, we're already merged with technology and we have our phones and we have our tablets, we have our Apple watches, we've got our televisions, but this is going, the dependence, we've already you know, got um, robotic hoovers for some people. <laughs> um, uh, we've got sort of um, Alexa, but um, this is, this dependence is going to, Get, grow even more and um, we're going to depend on um, artificial intelligence and robots and our connection to them may even um, grow so this 
close symbiotic relationship will grow and of course will impact our culture, identity, influence our norms. And as Mikio Kaku reminds us in his book, The Future of Humanity, robots don't get tired, don't need oxygen and can withstand extreme environments. So it seemed nonsensical not to rely on them for our species expansion into the solar system. So uh, I'm going to sort of move on because I'm running out of time as always, I'm talking too much. Um, so uh, yeah, so the other area, so we're looking at well-being ecosystem at this point, and we're trying to look at first of all the design, the habitat, um, who's you know what 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 we're doing, what we're trying to do, the vision. But now we're going to look at sort of actual what, what would these habitats look like, these future habitats, off-world habitats, um, um, let's say on Mars. What we've been doing, or what a lot of scientists and engineers and researchers are doing, is look uh, relying on biomimetics. Um, which is an interdisciplinary indis field in which principles from engineering, chemistry and biology are applied to synthesis of materials, synthetic systems or machines that have functions that mimic biological and natural processes for the purpose of solving complex human problems. So they're relying on uh, bio, uh, bio mimicry, as well as biophilia, which recognizes the health benefits of mankind's innate connection to nature and the health benefits, the psychological health and the physical health benefits that that connection um, can give rise to. So they're using concepts from these two areas to try to create designs that support well-being and support mental health and psychological um, uh, states. Um, so these concepts um, are applied in space psychology, therapy, engineering and architecture. And my field is space psychology and therapy, but others are applying it, as you can see, to build these um, sort of uh, self-sustainable um, habitats that are regenerative. Um, so what we're trying to what they're trying to do is create regenerative, regenerative adaptive, um, reliable systems that are sustainable off world. So I'll just give you a quick example before moving off to the next slide. Um, we've got the Mars petrified um, redwood forest ecopods design, which was um, conceived of by MIT team of researchers. Um, the pods are made up of dome shaped tree habitats that could house anywhere between 50 uh, for a single pod to 10,000 people for 200 pods. And uh, these tree systems are connected through a system of tunnels called roots. And the roots provide safe access to other tree habitats, private spaces, as well as plants and water and all of those things that we need. And they, these habitats also protect um, the inhabitants from the harsh conditions of um, their environment. So um, I'm not going to go through the other habitats, but they give you an idea of these types of um, sort of things that people are looking at. And one of my favorites is um, uh, myco uh, myco mycolo mycologist Paul um, Stamets. He's looking at mycelin um, and how we can use that in a way that can um, support life off world. Um, so he's looking at that in two areas. One is how we can use it to um, uh, create oxygen to support, um, as I said, life as we know it, but also um, in psychedelics, so psychedelic applied therapies. And is there a way that we can use that to support the well-being of people who are living either semi-permanently semi or um, permanently off-world? Um, so the following artist concept depicts what Martian habitats might look like in the near and far future. Now, you've got to think about what population are we talking about? Who's going to go out there? Will selection be based on performance, desirable skills, needs of new habitats? These habitats are going to be formed over many years. So is it performance intensive? Will it be performance intensive? Um, are, are we going to try to pick people who are strong, who can go and do building and construction like in the industrial age? industrialization age or are we going to um, rely on construction from you know nanobots and robots um, to do that work for us so who's going to go that's an important question for us to ask um, is, it, is there going to be a higher ratio of male or females are we going to have um, you know neurodiverse people going with that early population is it going to be a diverse mix of ethnicity race culture age abilities um, no one really knows fully um, but people are working on this um, so this is important because if we're seriously considering habitation programs, these early um, population is going to form the rituals 
um, and the norms and the uh, potentially the laws, whatever develops on that habitat. So who goes out there is an important question. Um, and of course, who goes out there, then you can design uh, countermeasures and uh, psychological applications that are suitable for the individual people and, and the group. So it would be wonderful for us to know, because then we can really make it unique, the design process, for their individual needs, for their developmental needs and for their um, gender needs, potentially. Um, so in terms of how many crew, is it four, is it six, is it a hundred, is it, you know, the first population, and is it going to go on the Starship that's just successfully launched, um, Elon Musk's um, Starship that did its first successful launch, and um, uh, what, uh, what, what will their po population be largely of a workforce, or just a community of, you know, uh, as representative of the normal population here on Earth? And what is a healthy number to go? What is the minimum and maximum uh, viable population size? Um, normally, for us, we think local as opposed to planetary in terms of human connections and relationships. So um, some people like uh, Robin Dunbar have suggested a, a, up to 150 meaningful relationships and others less and more. Uh, what about the genetically viable human population that avoids inbreeding? Because there's um, something called the 5500 rule, which suggests that a minimum population size of 50 is necessary to combat inbreeding and a um, minimum of uh, 500. Um, sorry, a maximum of 500. But the key thing here is, I mean, there's no exact number, but it gives you a sense of what we're trying to think about. Mobility, migration and colonization of new habitats are a major component of human demographic history. Such processes, processes have led to sharp changes in, our, um, in us as, as a human species here on Earth. Each time we've moved, um, we have impacted the environment that we've lived on, soil, water, climate, and created or interacted with pathogens. And this has changed, changes, this has caused changes in lifestyle and diet and altered um, the phenotypic composition of human popula populations. So we know that that's going to happen in a different way when we go off world. Um, and it's very important to think about the mutations, the pathogens, um, uh, the, the illnesses, uh, the evolutionary process of what happens to us. Um, so the, I'm not going to go too much into this, but this, this is just an image of some of the concepts of what some habitat, you know, uh, off world habitats might look like. But um, for example, you can see with Elon Musk's um, design, which is uh, on my right, which might be on your left at the top, you can mm. see that that's quite a basic concept, concept of, of a design. And my, my colleague, um, Britt Duffy, who's an urban designer, talked to me about actually how this type of a habitat, um, I think Elon Musk was just presenting a view, a simple view of what it might look like, but it's, it's, it's very basic and it hasn't thought about the larger scale project of actually how will this, this community grow into a town, into a city. How will we actually, you know, form um, travel? How will we travel? How will we communicate? How can we access each other? What will be the central points? So um, it's interesting to look at it. Um, but it, it just these concepts aren't accurate, but they give you an idea of, of you know, the stages of development. Human space exploration um, is going to um, be very hard on the human mind and body. And so we need to think about um, needs and the psychological needs um, of human beings. But even before we get to the psychological needs, we're going to think about the, uh, the survival needs. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it gives you an idea of how to break down, um, you know, the, the starting points of what's important first. And of course, the first thing is the physiological needs of how do we get um, spacefarers, off-world um, habitats, uh, simple things like air, water, food, uh, you know, uh, 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 cover, um, shelter sleep those things have to be covered first and then we move up um, into into uh, the other areas doesn't mean to say that those other areas aren't important and for me as a psychologist um, you know so a lot of great scientists are doing the work on the physiological needs but for me I'm thinking about the love and belonging needs of attachment esteem and and self-actualization how do we motivate people how do we help them um, move into um, you know um, move into optimal performance to be at their best um, and uh, to to remain connected. There's lots of missions off well uh, in uh, in uh, ISS uh, experiments on the International Space Station, but also on analog stations 
who've given us great data. There's also been the twin studies, which have helped us understand what happens to the human body and mind um, uh, in off-world habitats. And the twin studies were one year long and, and the first of its kind to try to look at what happens to um, our, our genetics, what happens to the bone, the muscle, and, and the psychology of people who live um, off world for a long period of time. There's been other long duration studies as well. Valerie Polyak, Polyakov, um, who also did a 438 day stint, I think. Um, and so these these have helped us to really understand what's going on, um, you know, in, in the human body and mind um, for isolated, confined and extreme environments. Um, and, you know, there's a lot going on and uh, I probably won't have time to go into it too much because I've only got ten, eight minutes left. Um, so um, what we do know is that human mi missions are um, they're going to basically affect genetic, epigenetic, psychological um, uh, parts of us. And it it's a mismatch to basically we have evolved here on earth and uh when we go off world there's a mismatch to um to our sort of uh, common terrestrial environment so these unique challenges we have to look at and create novel solutions for um so they're going to be environmental and physiological behavioral and performance interpersonal and psychiatric issues that we're going to think have to um, address um, the, for example, the environment may be mechanical environment, semi-sterile semi -sterile environment. Um, people might also have, you know, you're going to be in a hostile environment. So you're dealing with existential issues. Threat of safety to life is, is going to be you know, on your mind. Um, there's going to be disruption, disruptions to circadian rhythm. Our day night cycles are going to be, you know, completely off skew. Um, and, you know, for example, Mars, there's 43 percent sunlight. So it's not the same sunlight that we're used to here on Earth. Uh, on the moon, we've got 14 days um, of daytime, 14 days of nighttime, completely different pattern to what we're used to. Um, on the moon, it's gray, you know, so again, the lighting is completely different. Um, so all of this is going to affect us. Um, we're also, of course, the stuff, the common stuff, like high levels of cosmic radiation um, uh, that's going to be there. Microgravity, of course, there's some people that, that are trying to overcome microgravity by creating um, uh, simulated gravity thin and dry atmosphere, all of these things are going to be affecting our psyche, our minds. And so as and other areas, but as a psychologist, I need to think about that side more. And, you know, you're going to be missing out major world events. You're not going to have good communication with Earth. All of that is, um, you know, uh, on on um, uh, ongoing. So I think I'm going to go, you know, I think you get an idea of some of the problems. So beyond the survival and safety needs, there's going to also be issues with psychiatric disorders. At the basis of most psychiatric disorders is fear. If you think about obsessive compulsive disorder, if you think about social anxiety, if you think about any of these sort of common mental health disorders, they're complex. But at the basis of them is fear. And as psychologists, we'll, we deal with the um, underlying fears um, and so if you're in an environment that is presenting you with um, uh, a lot of threat, a lot of fear uh, is, will come up, um, anxiety, stress. And so as psychologists, we need to design applications that help offset some of that, that help people escape, that help people regulate, that help interception processes so people can just connect with themselves um, to um, support their well-being, to use light um, in a way that helps people, um, you know, um, calm down to go to sleep, um, because inevitably they're going to experience oscillations in mood. Um, go this is just uh, on a, like a standard day for people, the early um, uh, uh, population that moves out, oscillations in mood, dissociation, grief, they're going to, you know, maybe participate in deviant behavior, um, learned helplessness might come up or, or just felt helplessness. And some of those things, if they're not mitigated early on, can develop into psychiatric disorders. So mood or anxiety disorders, phobias, dissociative disorders, complex grief, break off syndrome, potentially, which is something that was um, around, um, which which was a syndrome that was around in the 70s, which is um, linked to um, disorientation and dread and anxiety arising for fighter pilots um, flying at low altitude. 
So we need to predict, identify, and we need to treat and, and early, early on rather than wait for things to develop. Um, but what we need to create is an ecosystem of well-being measures. These ecosystems, it's not just one application, it's a series of applications. It's a module, it's a hub. The applications need to be integrated into the well-being, um, not just in the well-being hub, but also into the entire habitat. They need to be sensitive, they need to be adaptive, adaptive they need to support the psychological developmental um, biological needs um, of of uh, the travelers and the spacefarers so we're looking at this sort of next generation of um, well-being designs and we're going to be heavily reliant on technology and effective computing techniques um, and countermeasures are going to be anything not just technology we're also going to need to think about um, how we're going to use nature within either virtual environments as well as um, uh, you know um, plants um, uh, how we're going to sort of try to create ways for people to engage with the na the natural setting that they're on but also the you know the plants that we take and the foliage that we take with us so I, I won't get time to talk about this um, because I want to talk with you guys a bit more. But here on Earthscape VR, uh, it's a company that I co-founded with um, a couple of colleagues off the back of my uh, PhD. We founded uh, this pr uh, company. We've got three pillars basically to it. One is it's a virtual reality and extended reality company that creates programs that uh, recreate um, expansive and extraordinary landscapes, including space. We couple in effective computing techniques. We couple in um, bilateral stimulation. We couple in music, science of music, meditation. Um, we've created four or five programs. At the moment, we've researched it with the general population. We've got some great results to show that we can uh, elicit awe in a significant number of people and uh, uh, strengthen connectedness to nature. Now we're looking at um, other populations, for example, mental health and analog and astronauts to see if our, our, um, our programs can work with them. So we're offering one solution for this ecosystem. I'm going to stop there so we can have a couple of minutes of a chat. I'm so sorry it took a bit longer. I always do this, so I'll stop there. Yeah. So is there are there any questions before we shoot off for a couple of minutes? We can have a chat amongst us. I think if you open the chat, uh, just the last couple. So Nick Nilsson wrote a couple of questions. Nine, 12 past, 19, 13 past. Will uh, there be distinctive coping mechanisms for human beings in the space environment is one. Um, so I think this is this is amazing for me. I'm I'm very much into um, at the moment polyvagal um, theory by um, Stephen Porges, for example, who talks about um, different types of breathing at, to um, downregulate or upregulate the nervous system. We're using these techniques here, but I'm very interested in how we can use technology. Um, and not just ourselves, because we're, we're a technology in, in and of ourselves, we can use ourselves to try to regulate our minds and bodies, but we can also rely on technology um, to help us do that. And so the polyvagal uh, theory looks at the polyvagal nerve and looks at different breathing techniques in order to help people settle down and, and calm down. Um, I think in terms of um, how else we can try to help people cope, I think um, introception is is our ability to connect with our internal world and really know what's going on and really understand in a healthy way um, uh, how the states that we're in and how to um, respond to that. So I think, again, with the certain technologies that can help us, you know, and we're already using them in different ways, but we can really um, extend that and improve on the technologies we've got here on Earth. Um, to support the well-being of people off world so you can think about things like um, you know meditation tools online meditation tools or apps um, how can we use that for people to sort of um, you know help them regulate themselves but I also think the psychedelic psychedelic assisted therapies have got some relevance um, I, I'm not talking about you know taking a um, LSD, you know when you're on Mars but what I am saying is that potentially micro dosing or technoetic applications that can help people uh, escape in a healthy way will be will be very helpful um, for early population uh, of dwellers or for people who are 
um, semi-permanently or on a long long duration space mission. Um, so I, I do think that there's some relevance to that as well. Of course, there's always nature, anything to do with nature, gardening, anything like that is always helpful. You won't have the fresh air, you won't have the birds singing, you won't have all of those kinds of things that you rely on, um, you know, beautiful cold water that we have in the morning, stuff, you know, not quite in the same way, you won't have it in that way. So you really need to account for that. And also just being quite contained. You know, we, we need our freedom because we're conscious beings with intelligence, we like to think. Um, and mm -hmm. we often, even on Earth, feel enclosed and, uh, you know, we feel like trapped. And so if we go off world, we need to really factor in that. So anything that can help us escape in a healthy way, I think, is good. I hope, Nick, that was um, a bit of an answer to your question. Similarly, before the distance is like for human beings. Uh, can be forecast distinctive psychopathologies for human beings in the space environment. Yeah, so um, so that's why we're looking into, so I've partnered up with Deakin and Coventry Universities, for example, and we're looking at effective um, combining VR technology with effective computing techniques to try to create uh, an adaptive, automated um, uh, well-being solution that can measure um, the effective state, so this, the, the physiological states of people um, and uh, it's an intuitive AI system uh, and that's when it's developed so we'd hopefully there's PhD students who are working on it and we're going to develop some kind of a prototype but um, that if that system is created then we can effectively measure the um, you know the, the physiological states of, of, of people to then indicate um, what states they are so are they you know are they experiencing low hedonic tone have they got um, you know uh, if they have intense variability you know where their heart rate's going up and down uh, too dramatically you know then we can um, in intervene appropriately and provide the solution whether it's VR or um, uh, nature-based or you know in a, in a planetarium or or wh whatever they're going to be doing um, some social activity perhaps um, then you can prescribe almost, you know, um, more accurately. And so